Robinhood and Callshe are taking on Polymarket now in event contracts to be able to bet on the U.S. election. And Big night for prediction markets and calling President uh, Trump elect as the winner at the polls closed. All right, raise your hand if you've heard of poly market before. Well, chances are, if you were following the US elections at all, then there's no way that you could have missed it. Yesterday at 6 a.m., FBI agents entered a New York City apartment inhabited by a shaggy-haired 26-year-old crypto bro named Shane Copeland and raided his home. <laughs> The feds are not too happy with him right now because he runs a website called Polymarket that allows users to buy futures contracts about the outcome of world events, like will the US confirm aliens exist, will there be a monkeypox pandemic, is Taylor Swift pregnant, and who will win the 2024 presidential election. It sounds like a cool website. The FBI raid signals what happens when prediction markets hit mainstream adoption. But beneath the headlines, three fundamental problems plague these systems. Problems that determine whether they produce wisdom or chaos. I've been digging deeper into the space for months, and the mechanics matter more than the hype suggests. The first problem is Oracle centralization. Who decides what actually happened? In a previous video, we covered problems with UMA's optimistic Oracle. For example, four addresses control over 50% of the voting power. That creates a risk where the resolution layer can be gamed. Polymarket also has their own issues retroactively modifying resolution criteria via clarification banners. UMA's design has a fundamental game-theoretic flaw. Participants can both trade in the market and arbitrate its resolution outcome. That bakes in a profit motive misaligned with truth. You're no longer just predicting reality, you're predicting whether the resolution layer will acknowledge reality. Consider the Zelensky NATO suit market. There was clear evidence, videos, photos, news sources showing him wearing a suit, yet the market resolved no suit. When oracles fail, the entire market becomes unreliable. The second problem is market creation bottlenecks, what we call the long tail problem. We're limited to whatever polymarket staff chooses to list. Thousands of questions people want to bet on never get markets because manual curation doesn't scale. The third problem is infrastructure cost and liquidity. Creating a new market is expensive. Maintaining liquidity is harder. Most prediction markets in the early 2000s died because they couldn't solve this chicken and egg problem. You need traders to create liquidity, but you need liquidity to attract traders. This isn't the first time prediction markets have promised to revolutionize decision making. There was a burst of interest in the 2000s, but regulatory pressure and technical limitations killed most platforms. As crazy as it may sound, back then, the Pentagon's policy analysis market, PAM, proposed betting on geopolitical events, including terrorist attacks. Congress killed it in 2003 after public outcry. Intra filled the void until the CFTC shut them down in 2013. But crypto changed the game. Robin Hanson's logarithmic market scoring rule, LMSR, provided the mathematical foundation these platforms needed. Here's how it works. Instead of matching buyers and sellers directly, LMSR lets market makers subsidize thin markets without getting arbitrage to death. The algorithm automatically adjusts prices based on betting activity, solving the liquidity bootstrap problem that killed earlier platforms. With these technical foundations in place, I wanted to understand what comes next. So, I decided to go to DAPCON Berlin to listen to and talk with the world's experts on prediction markets. This year's conference had an unusual concentration of prediction market builders. Truth coin and uh, Paul Stortz's work, and then since then, uh, Polymarket. With Polymarket hitting mainstream adoption, everyone wanted to discuss solutions to these three core problems. I had useful conversations about new architectures that might finally solve them. The most promising I saw was Exo Market. They're addressing the long tail problem directly. Anyone can create a market, no curation bottleneck. They also tackle the Oracle problem with an AI LLM based resolution system. It defaults to verifying sources and only escalates ambiguous cases to human jurors. That makes it faster, fairer, and harder to game than traditional oracles like UMA. But to really understand where this space is heading, I wanted to hear from the people who built the foundations for this field. 
Um, so I uh, yeah, I guess I'm I'm, I'm curious uh, compared to your um, expectations of uh, this uh, space uh, back then. Like, how, how do you feel about the impact that uh, prediction markets have uh, made since? Uh, um, I guess um, you know the yeah, idea and our attempts to make it happen have started. So the audience might not know that there was a burst of interest in prediction markets in the aughts. And then many companies explored and tried and many firms were pursuing it. And then that interest faded mm. <laughs> and there was a long a period of disinterest and low yeah. activity. Here, Robin's talking about the same period I mentioned earlier, when PAM and Intrade were pushing boundaries before regulatory backlash hit. And then faded crypto, because of the yeah. CFTC or it, the interest it faded, faded because of just lack of business interest. That is, I mean, there were some things CFTC messed with, but basically most executives are shy about sure. implementing prediction markets. So this follows a classic pattern in technology adoption. New tools often look like toys to established players. Executives saw prediction markets as too speculative, too risky for corporate adoption. But crypto changed the deployment model entirely. No permission needed. No regulatory approval required. If you want to know when a company will deliver on a deadline, say, the release of ChatGPT5, you don't need Sam Altman's permission. We can launch a prediction market on it and get an estimate from collective intelligence. It hadn't been implemented well enough, not enough marketing, whatever, but like, product failed temporarily. Yeah. And then crypto people started and seeing you're as the sort of thing. about that, users not using our technology. Right? No. I'm, I, it's the issue, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Can you make something users want? Yes. Mm. Uh, but then crypto people saw this as a one of the key applications that they could ma imagine selling uh, through a decentralized neutral platform. And so that was part of the initial appeal for many early crypto projects uh, and platforms. And then they took a long time to actually get much user revenue attraction, but that's okay for crypto, apparently. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all right to have a long lead in, but then in the last few years, we've got this burst with Polymarket, and that's great to see. And that will certainly lower costs because the more you know you pay for an infrastructure, the more you can make lower costs other things. And so I'm, of course, most excited that these lowering costs will allow us to expand in other markets. Here's Robin referencing that third problem I outlined earlier, infrastructure costs. His LMSR algorithm is what made Polymarket's growth possible. By solving the liquidity problem mathematically, platforms could finally scale beyond niche betting communities. Yeah. That is, you know, we've had betting markets for a long time at a modest cost, and lowering the cost of betting markets does increase the demand for them, but the elasticity of demand isn't that high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a limited demand, I think, for just speculators betting on things. Uh, There's, you know, the lower price will increase it, but I'm envious for or, or eager for this vastly larger market out there that eventually we could tap of people who need to make decisions who want advice, and there's huge value there, but that's harder to tap. This gets to the real vision behind prediction markets. They're not just gambling platforms. They're information aggregation systems. The money is a side effect. What we're really buying is collective intelligence. Robin's pointing towards corporate decision making, but the applications span further. Think supply chain risk, product launch timing, research prioritization, Etc. That's what people were trying to tap in the aughts, and that's a, that's a harder nut. The next few years will determine which path we take. New platforms like ExoMarket are tackling the technical challenges, but the regulatory landscape remains uncertain. What's clear is that prediction markets have moved beyond crypto curiosities. They're becoming infrastructure for collective decision making. If you found this video useful, subscribe for more analysis of emerging technologies. I've got a lot more prediction market content coming and coverage of the most promising tech I found at DAPCON. I've linked Robin Hansen's original LMSR paper and the ExoMarket technical documentation in the description. Let me know in the comments which prediction market problems you think are most critical to solve. Thanks for watching.